Okay. Uh, thank you all for showing up today. Today we have a book discussion with the co-editors of Gaza and Silas, a collection of articles, poems, uh, co-edited by uh, Rifat Larair and Layla Al-Haddad and published by uh, Just With uh, Books about the 2014 uh, Gaza Offensive. Uh, this book is not the first to, to be published uh, by the author's editors uh, in 2013. Uh, sorry, 2014, Al-Fatlaray uh, published a book called Gaza Rice Back, uh, which uh, contained 23 short stories about the 2008-2009 uh, Gaza Offensive. And Layla Al-Haddad uh, published two books previously, Gaza Mom and Gaza Kitchen, for those who like food. Uh, so today, Nassi uh, Al-Ari will, will, will talk about the publication of this book, which recently came out. Uh, then we will have Layla Al-Haddad over Skype. Uh, this will be followed by Q and A. So please get ready. If you have any question, comment. Uh, I want you to get uh, involved. Yes, Mr. Al-Ari, the floor is, is yours. Thank you. Shukran, Yusuf. You should never say for those who love food because we all love food. Okay. So it's just for everybody. Uh, that's a redundant statement, but anyway, it's not my business. Uh, Gaza, uh, Gaza Unsilenced as, as, a bo as a project I have been involved in is probably uh, one of the most if not the most painful uh, experiences in my life, the very uh, idea of the book itself, working uh, on the book, because it's, uh, it has like so much of me personally, and it touches everybody I care about, as Palestinians, as, uh, as Gazans. Uh, the war has has not left anybody untouched in Gaza, not even a stone untouched. Uh, and that's, in my opinion, something Israel has been working on. Because one way or another, the conflict uh, will be resolved in a way or another. There will uh, come a time when, you know, uh, the Israeli politicians realize that it's, uh, it's both destroying Palestinians' lives and Israelis' lives to occupy others and uh, uh, you know, steal uh, everything they own, their lives, their hopes, their futures, their uh, resources, their raw, their raw materials and, and everything. But because Israeli leaders realize that this day is, is, is going to come sooner or later, they, they're trying to hurt everybody, every Palestinian uh, in, in, whether in Gaza Strip, in the uh, West Bank, or Jerusalem, uh, Palestinians of the 1948 uh, or in the diaspora. So when everybody is hurt, when everybody has a, a scar in their hearts and uh, memories and pasts and futures, it would be very difficult, very, very difficult for people to, to forgive. And that's, in my opinion, the worst uh, uh, and the most brutal thing Israel is doing, because forgiving is, an, is, is, is a very important uh, feature of human beings. It's very important to be forgiving, uh, especially for people who hurt you. But when there are layers and layers and layers and layers of pains and, uh, and, 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 and scars, sometimes it gets very difficult. And I think Israel is making it very difficult. So uh, personally, uh, in, in the war, um, my, my brother was killed, uh, my house, and when we speak about Palestinian houses, you know, a house of uh, four floors, six uh, flats, it took us 30, uh, 30 years to build, it was gone, just in you know, a, a click of, of, of a mouse. And with our house, uh, my uncle's house, and my other uncle's house, and our neighbor's house, and neighbor's house, uh, I lost uh, five immediate uh, relatives. Uh, four of them were executed from a short range inside their own houses. 
I lost uh, uh, seven in-laws, uh, and that's in my in my mother's view. Like when I wasn't in, I wasn't in Gaza during the war. Maybe some of you know I was outside, and somebody sent me a message on Twitter telling me, "Listen, I'm telling you something, and I don't want you, you to freak out." And I said, "Go on. I'm a big guy." He said, "There is." 95% uh, of chance that your brother was killed. And that's the worst thing you could ever hear. It's, it's even worse than your brother was killed, because you don't know. And my first reaction was, does the family know? He said, no, they don't know. Are you sure? He said, no, nobody is sure, nobody is certain. But if you're not certain, you shouldn't tell me. I picked my phone, I called uh, my, my mom, and uh, my daughter, Shayma, uh, replied, and she was okay. How is your mom okay? How is your uh, grandma okay? Can I talk to your grandma? Kif halik, yama, how are you? How is everything? We're fine. Is everybody okay? Yeah, we're fine. And I started, we have a long uh, family. I have seven brothers. We are eight boys and six girls. And I started naming all my brothers. How is Hani? How is Muhammad? How is Salah? How is, are you sure they're okay? Did you talk to them all recently? They said, yeah, they're okay. And then I had to live for like two days knowing the news, not being able to tell my family because it's only 95% uh, is certain. And again, two days later, when there was a truce, they went to uh, Shijaiya, and you know what happened in, uh, in Shijaiya, and uh, you've seen everything. And then I have to write about this. So living the experience is something. And then having to turn the story of your brother into something that, is, uh, that, that everybody relates to, everybody around the world. Uh, uh, especially because I write in English. I don't like in Arabic. I think uh, we don't read stuff in Arabic, sadly. But uh, uh, again, because we also, I don't know, maybe we have given up on Arabs helping standing with us, especially with the situation in the Gulf, uh, in Syria, in Egypt, the situation in Gaza, and again, you're experiencing this, has never been worse because of what's going on in Egypt and in Sinai. Uh, so that's one reason why, personally, I prefer to write in English. And I think those people living in America, and Brazil, in the UK, in Europe, in, in Africa, in Asia, in Australia, they have more, I'm sorry to say this, and I'm not sure if, I am, if it is the right thing to say, but they have more humanity than most Arabs. And the situation in Gaza, in Palestine, in and in Syria, I think makes this a fact in a way or another. And you've seen the picture yesterday uh, of the little kid uh, face down dead the Mediterranean. It's probably the most uh, painful thing you will uh, ever see. So writing about your own, your, the, the death of your brother, and uh, like you want to immortalize him, you want to give him a life that nobody knows. A life that Israel has turned into a cartoon. A life that Israel has turned into a stupid cartoon, Hasbara and propaganda and, you know, human shields and uh, terrorists and hiding stuff, I don't know where. Uh, uh, I didn't want my brother to be reduced into a number. And again, when I speak about my brother, I speak about everybody in Gaza, about the 2,251 uh, Palestinians, uh, uh, more or less. And th that's one, one reason f behind uh, compiling this, uh, uh, this book. So when I started writing about uh, uh, my brother uh, Muhammad uh, Hamada, he's well known uh, for Hamada, and Hamada is the name I, 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 I gave him. Uh, and I, by the way, I named three of my brothers and sisters. Uh, there's a 20 year gap distance between me, the second uh, brother, and uh, a brother number, uh, kid number 14 in the family, uh, Abdul Rahman, with whom I name also. So with Hamada, it was like, it was, it's, it's like, it was like he was my, my, my own son. Because I named him, I owned him. I was like, 
I spent like years as a kid shouting at everybody, calling him uh, Muhammad, his official name. No, he's not Muhammad, he's Hamada. No, no, Hamada. And it, he became Hamada. Everybody called him Hamada. Wherever he went, he was Hamada, except for my dad. Uh, he never called him Hamada. But again, when, when you come at a time to, to, to say something about your dead brother, you don't know what to say. Nothing, nothing gives him what he deserves because his life was untimely, unjustly cut short by a barbaric uh, Israeli uh, occupation, an occupation that hates to see Palestinians living their lives uh, 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 to the full. And a year later, that article I included in, in, in the book, a year later I wrote another article about uh, uh, my, my uh, nephew uh, Hamza, Muhammad's, Hamada's son, and uh, Ranim Hamada's, my, my niece Ranim Hamada's daughter. The article, which I also published uh, for the electronic, with the electronic intifada, that's the article on the electronic intifada, the first one I wrote during the war. The story of my brother, Martyr Muhammad al -Arir. Please, if you have time, try to, uh, to read it. That's my brother, that's uh, Ranim. And my brother was an actor, by the way. Maybe you know him now, some of you, because he was always uh, on Friday, uh, Big Bird. No, it's CD. So the second piece I wrote uh, was almost a year after the war and the article says, when will dad come back? And that's the question Ranim has been asking my, uh, my mother, her grandma. She has always been very close to her dad. It wasn't very easy to separate them. Now, during the war, uh, which I mean, it's something I mentioned here also in the piece, uh, my brother Hamada, he's, I know, like we all have brothers and good friends, but he's an amazing person. He was, he was very selfless. He always was there, you know, to help. And uh, so during the war, he was helping people go, get out of, you know, Shijaiya in a way that would guarantee them safety. And the last thing he, he said to his wife is that I'll be back. Like, uh, uh, just go on, I'll go back, I'll see if I can help others, and he has never come back uh, uh, since then. Uh, and his, his daughter still remembers this uh, uh, encounter, like, I will be back, don't worry, because she was crying and, and he said, I'll be back soon, I promise, I'll be back soon. And he never came back. Not because he doesn't want to, not because he never uh, kept a promise, but because, again, the occupation has always severed all kinds of, of, of uh, relationships. Now, now the, the impact on my uh, uh, nephew and niece is enormous, the negative impact, psychologically in so many ways. And again, you can't describe this unless you have uh, people who, inshallah, nobody will have this. Like, you know people who, who lost their dad, uh, uh, especially when they're very, 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 very uh, small, like kids and orphans and, and you know, uh, toddlers. So, uh, in the article I speak about my other, my, my other nephew, Muhammad, who insisted on his dad, uh, kept saying, Dad, I want to go to Shijaiya, I want to go to Shijaiya, I want to go back home. Uh, we wanted, I don't know, we, we kind of didn't want him to go back and see the destruction, but because he insisted on his dad, he took him to Shijaiya, and, and Muhammad is, by the way, only six years old. But see how, how they grow because of the experience, the horrible experiences they go, they go through. And when he saw the house destroyed, rubble, you know, a pile of, of, of whatever, he dangled his head like this and said, I wish I hadn't come. And that's probably the most mature thing I have heard, heard from a human being, a post-war thing. He's only six years old. And seeing this, I wish I hadn't come. I wish I hadn't seen this. And that's one, one reason why the reconstruction is being delayed, because Israel wants to damage uh, all 
uh, our hearts, our memories, and, 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 and everything. Israel wants to keep the, the, the horrible memories of death and destruction and to imprint them in our uh, uh, memories. So because of this, we didn't want to take uh, Ranim back to see the house, or at least to show her that the house was, uh, was, was, was destroyed. Well, and I, I said something about how, you know, the war, the impact of the war, uh, and I think this should be, in a way, studied by psychologists and everything. So she keeps asking my mom, uh, ever since Ranim has been asking about her dad, when will dad come back? Why doesn't Baba, why does Baba not come back? She keeps asking. So because of the story with Muhammad taking Ranim and lit the little ones to see the pile of rubble our house was turned into is now out of the question. We are only counting on a speedy reconstruction process that will mitigate the pain and return the kids to their houses. A month after the Israeli onslaught, Ranim must have realized that her dad would not be coming back again. She approached my mother and said, Teta, I, I dislike dad. He doesn't come back. And, and I think my, my mom hasn't recovered from this. Like when she said, I hate dad. As a Palestinian, as an academic, as an, uh, I'm not a writer actually, but as a person who writes, I wanted to inform the world with, with this. I wanted this to be uh, not only my story, but the stories of every Palestinian in, uh, in, in, the, Ga in the Gaza and, 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 and elsewhere. That's why we mentioned at the end of the book, there's an, a, 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 an index with the names of all the people that Israel slaughtered in, in Gaza. Some of those people made their way to the book with features, with stories about their names, what they loved, what they hated, what they wanted to do, what they didn't, didn't want to do in, in their lives, in order to give them a voice, a face, something that we don't usually see uh, in the news, uh, something we don't see from, uh, from afar. I wanted to take the stories of those Palestinians into the heart of uh, and the mind and the memories of every human being, every free human being around around, around the world, showing them that we are we are a people that are we are we're capable of having of you know determining our our future. That it's not that the 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 what we're suffering from is not you know lack of food or lack. Although that is a, a problem in in so many ways here, it's only lack of freedom and lack of rights. And that as long as the occupation goes hopefully life will be, will be uh, uh, a lot better. That's why uh, 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 the article, that's uh, Hamza, and that's uh, Ranim, that the article concludes with something like, how do you tell a little girl her father is never coming back? And that's a year after the, uh, after the, uh, the war. Gaza writes back in, in brief, is Leila on? Uh, sorry, I said the Gaza rights back. Uh, Gaza and Silence is a compilation of articles, mainly written by Palestinians, mostly by uh, uh, Palestinian uh, voices from the Gaza Strip, because we wanted to showcase and highlight these uh, voices. We used uh, some articles by non-Palestinians, pro-Palestinians, uh, in order to try to build, to help uh, 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 build a comprehensive uh, picture of what was going on, uh, not only during the war, but before the war, not a year, not a month, not 10 years, but when the occupation started, because the, the 2014 uh, destructive war on the Gaza Strip is only uh, uh, one of a long, 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 long journey of suffering, of, of attacks, of a series of massacres that Israel uh, has committed. The, the war, as probably you, you saw the video by Dina Takruri, the war was uh, first claimed to be to, you know, get rid of the rockets, which all it came back after Israel violated that rules like 600 times, and then to get rid of the tunnels, and then to get rid of uh, Hamas, and then to get rid of uh, the resistance, and it's every time Israel changed why they, they launched uh, the war. And the, the amount of destruction and, and, and the number of people who died, uh, everything tells us that Israel meant to send a message not only to Palestinians, but to people 
to neighboring countries that this is what we do with people. So they used Palestinians in Gaza as like, like guinea pigs, like uh, 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 lab rats, that this is what we do. In, in, in a very, very, very striking resemblance to what uh, ISIS is doing now. ISIS is the propaganda videos. The similarity is really uncanny. How, the, how, how those uh, sick criminal people murder and the way we, we see all the time on, uh, on the internet online, how they uh, kill people in, 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 in all the horrible ways they, uh, they do in order to uh, spook away people, to terrorize, terrorize and terrify people, and at the same time to recruit. Some people like what ISIS do, that's why they travel and, and, and join ISIS. And Israel is doing the same. They're doing this to market Israel, market Israeli weapons to, uh, to uh, with our, uh, and, and technology, whether to America, you know, to help with the wall with Mexico, or to India, or even to some Arab countries. Uh, sooner or later, Saudi Arabia, for example, will be building a wall and buying drones and, and, uh, and stuff. Uh, and at the same time, to market, you know, the the uh, the image of the of Israel as being the most powerful, the most invincible army in the world. And hey, Jews of the world, come join us if you want to. We can give you a house. Uh, I don't know loans, uh, cheaper uh, uh, housing, and you can carry a gun and you get to shoot all the time. And this is happening. We've seen how uh, during the war, for example. Uh, Jewish people from America, from, uh, from around the almost uh, everywhere, from around the world, were coming to Israel and, you know, wanting to volunteer. What, what difference does that make from people coming from around the world to join, to join ISIS? Nothing. There's no difference at all. So the way Israel was killing Palestinians, and that was my answer to a question why Israel allowed so many people, so many activists, so many journalists uh, to, you know, speak about the war. Why didn't they just cut off the electricity and, and the internet? Uh, in, in, in so many ways, Israel uh, fears nobody nowadays. No, no, no Arab countries, no uh, Western countries are, are putting any kind of pressure on Israel to say, to stop Israel, to punish those criminals or send them, uh, send them to court. So, uh, Ga uh, Gaza Unsilenced, uh, which again I edited with uh, the amazing uh, Layla Al Haddad. I hope she's not hearing, uh, listening to me now. Uh, contains a long introduction, which we again published on Mundu Weiss, Unsilencing Gaza one year since Operation Protective. It, it's, it's long, but it has the summary is, is here. Please try to read it, and if you have questions or you know feedback, send, up, send, send it to us. I'm waiting for Layla, but let me just say uh, something about the content of the, the book. The book has uh, six chapters, in addition to the long uh, uh, introduction. Uh, chapter number one speaks about the human toll, uh, the stories of uh, people, uh, individuals, and groups, and families that Israel uh, slaughtered. And then about the, uh, how Israel is del deliberately uh, uh, targeting Palestinian infrastructure, destroying schools, universities, colleges, uh, factories, uh, agriculture, almost everything, so that they, they, they literally send, back, send Gaza back uh, in time decades back. And then uh, there's an article about how Palestinians elsewhere reacted to the war in their writing, in their uh, reactions with her in the West Bank, Jerusalem, uh, 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 Palestinians uh, in, in 1948 areas, uh, Palestinians in the diaspora, and then how international uh, activists, how pal uh, pro-Palestinians reacted, how they, uh, what they did with her uh, in their own words or people describing, for example, protests in America in uh, uh, South America, in uh, South Africa, in Asia. And then there's an article, uh, there's a, a chapter about social media and creative responses to uh, the Israeli uh, crimes. And finally, uh, uh, Gaza a year later. The uh, chapter, as the name tells, 
shows that nothing has happened a year after, and even the situation is, 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 is not worse, it's a lot worse. It's a slow death for so many, and probably we've seen this even during the war, so many people would say, if, if it takes a war for people to, you know, to pay attention and to really do something to change, let it be a war, then it's sad, but that's the situation. The situation in Gaza is, is a lot worse on so many levels, the un unemployment, the uh, lack of uh, salaries for so many people, lack of, uh, you know, opportunities, reconstruction. Okay, so we are trying to connect with, uh, thank you, Rifat. Uh, we are trying to connect with Leila. Uh, we'll take questions from Rifat now, and uh, Manuel will try to connect with him. Yeah. If you have questions, come in, please share. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, actually, I'm uh, in front of a uh, very wonderful and amazing uh, work that adds to your blessed Gaza rights fair, but amazing. And uh, as far as I, uh, I can say now, that uh, anti lance in Gaza is another wonderful work. Actually, I have two points, or two questions, uh, simple questions. The first question is, where is the book? Is it printed? Is it, uh, how can we get it even hard or soft coming? And I know that you have asked this question many, many times before. Yeah. Um, my other point is uh, for, yeah, how do, yeah, do you market that book, for example, in, uh, in the European and in America, Canada, and so on? You, you know, as far as I guess that you should do a lot of work on, on marketing those books in order for our message to be conveyed for most people. Mm -hmm. From another point, is it written in English? Is there a, 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 any kind of a translation for other languages? Not only French or Spain mm -hmm. or the Spanish, sorry, or other, no. I want, for example, for Chinese language. Mm -hmm. You know yes. that one seventh of the population, the world population, speaks uh, Chinese. Uh, so, Please, if you can clarify those points, I'm going to be grateful. Thank you very much again. Very much. Okay. It's embarrassing, but we don't have the book in Ghana. It's, uh, we, we didn't, we didn't manage to, when I can Uh, we didn't manage to bring a copy from the book to Gaza because of, you know, no the situation. Did you print it here? No, it was printed by Just World Books. A very, it's, it's, it's a small uh, uh, publishing house in America, but it's very important. It's publishing more and more books about the, West, uh, the Middle East and, 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 and uh, especially about Palestine. Uh, my, my Gaza Rights Back, our Gaza Rights Back, was also published by uh, Just Blood Books. It's a very small but very important uh, publishing house in the United States, run by Helena Kuban. Uh, Gaza Unsilence was also published by uh, it's an American and available around the world. Uh, I think hard copy so far, Amazon and through the, uh, their website. Uh, how do I market? I usually market the book by tweeting about it, but because it's usually very embarrassing when you, because you want the book out. When you, by the way, when you write a book like this, you don't become a millionaire. And by the way, we spent a year, a whole year working on the book. It's very time consuming. Okay, but sometimes I personally don't feel uh, that I want to do a lot of. Uh, you know, tweeting about the book. I do sometimes, but then uh, I leave it to pe the, the people, the Palestinians and pro-Palestinians to do this. Okay, so that the people, uh, like more and more people get the book and buy it and then uh, show it to, to other people, we we'll lend it to people or ask them or uh, recommend the book to, uh, to them. So we usually, or I think it's your, uh, it's very important for you know, activists, people like you to do marketing, not only for this book, 
a lot of books. There's uh, this book by Muhammad Omar, probably one of the best books ever. Muhammad Omar is the best journalist writing in English in, in, in the whole Palestine. Uh, uh, and he, he printed the book here in Gaza, uh, Shin Shock, wonderful book. Uh, there is also uh, Max Blumenthal's book, uh, uh, 51 Day of, uh, and that is an amazing. Uh, he was here during the war. Yeah, an amazing uh, writer. Yeah, I, like uh, I think there is, there's also a couple of books that uh, The Drone Eats With Me by Atta Abu Seif, wonderful book. The, the drone eats with me, something like this. Al Safe, right? Yeah, yeah. That's an amazing book. So it's not about it's not about this book. It's about telling the people around what to read. And and when when when, when they read, they get the book. They put it. They read it. They put it on the shelf. And then uh, their family members, their neighbors, uh, gets out there. That's the best thing about books. Once it's there, it's out there for everybody to uh, to read. Regarding translation, translation is very important. Very, very important. Uh, especially to you know people who don't read English. And we've been very much dependent on those people, like those who read English. I think it's very unfair that people in China, in, in Japan, in Brazil, and people who you know even Spanish or Portuguese or Bengali or Urdu or those languages don't get to read this. We've managed to do this with Gaza Rights Back. Gaza Rights Back has been translated into Japanese, into Italian, into uh, Turkish, into Malay, and probably more languages are coming. Arabic, not yet. Uh, yeah. Maybe in, in a year or two, I don't know. Maybe not, never. Okay. So yeah, hopefully it uh, can be translated. Arabic, not the languages. They don't. Actually, we're going to follow the same steps for the Gaza and silence. Again, there's a difference. Gaza and silence is a compilation of articles. Okay? Gaza Writes Back is a compilation of short stories. Fiction, short fiction that, you know, mainly based uh, in reality. But I was following the social media, for example, during the war, and I noticed that many people started to write, even not writers, started to write creative things, and it was really amazing. After like the 40 days of the war, or at the end of the war, uh, no, I mean at the end, before the end of the war, like we stopped writing, or we just like, we fed up. And uh, people started uh, around the world not following like at the beginning or at the middle of the world. So we are writing. People read, put it on the shelf. Another people are from America and read the time again. Why we are writing these things? The political situation is not changing at all. The war continues, and we are expecting another war these days, as uh, as we see, we see in, in the news. So the, 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 the Arab situation is getting worse and worse. So are we writing for the next generations, for history, and then they will, the other generations will read about us, uh, like what we are reading for, for example, uh, Charles Dickens about the Victorians, and then another after four, 400 years, 200 years, uh, they, want, they will talk about us. Why are we writing these things? This is the main question. I, the I reason behind these Leila, words, yeah. Leila is, uh, is online. You managed to get online. Yeah. Yes. So a bit brief. I know you are a writer. You write. And you know part of the possible. I'm asking myself this question all exactly. the time. But in, in my opinion, I, I personally write for myself usually. Because it's a true writing that you come uh, to tell with yourself. Yeah. You come to make sense of yeah. the of the situation. And there's another important issue about writing. It's a, it's, it's a healing. There is the therapeutic, therapeutic uh, impact of, or, or, or uh, aspect of writing. It's, in a way, it's like you go through a, a, a particular experience and it's horrible. You can't uh, make sense. When you start writing or talking to people about this particular, you start like crying and and so in a way that cleanses your 
your pain, your feeling, your feelings of anger, of, of revenge. So writing is, is our revenge, in a way. It's a very creative way to release the anger, the wrath uh, we have inside. But that's again my, my answer. You could have uh, you know, other possible answers. But again, Layla? OK, we'll go for Layla now, and then we'll take like, a few more questions, because it's been waiting. Um, Layla, let's go on. You can take a break. Maybe you, you could give up on those people, on officials. Uh, 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 in our Gaza rights back tour to the States, we met officials. We went to, uh, to you know... Uh, what kind of officials? Congress? Yeah, and we gave them a copy of the book, and some people, our friend Laura Lucero, sent a copy of the book to, uh, to Barack Obama and stuff. We have to do this. We know, we feel that, like there's 99%, more than 95%. So I think that it's not going to be read. But you do what you want to do. However, like Mona said something, it's, writing is also about writing for the people in the future. Leaving a testimony behind, leaving something behind for people to, to try to understand in, in, in 10 years, in 20 years, what was uh, happening. And probably a person who might read your book now might end up being something. The West is in many ways different from us. If somebody is the president, he's the president for the rest of his life, and then his kids follow and everything. But we've seen, for example, in some European countries, uh, the, minister, was it the Minister of Education, he was like 27? Yes. So, so this, the guy could be somebody you go, you study MA with, or you meet in Oxford or London, at a particular university. So change is, 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 is happening, it's very slow, it's gaining momentum, especially with the amazing work PBS is doing in America and, uh, and around the world. As more and more people are and, uh, understanding what's going on 
in a way or another. And as Palestinians, we have a moral obligation to be out, to talk to people, to address people, to engage in constructive dialogue. It's not only for Palestine, because injustice in Palestine is injustice. And if you want to see how, what's, what, how, how Palestine is, is, is helping the Palestine, uh, the issue of Palestine, she's not talking. Okay, if you see for example what's happening to black, black people in, in America, almost all pro-Palestinians stand with Black Lives Matter. And almost all pro-Israel Israelis are racist bigots. I'm sorry to say this, but it's, we've seen this everywhere. All those famous pro-Israelis are really, really racist, because not only because they hate Palestinians or you know, because they love Israel, but because they, have, they hate Latinos, they hate uh, uh, Chinese, they hate black people, they hate... And look at what Israel for example, is doing to black people. So we have to unite. In, in, in the United States, the work in that, you know, the people from, you know, the Latinos, the Chinese, the black people, that are kind of coming together to try to change. And like, um, like I just said, change is, is happening. Look at the Presbyterian change, uh, church in America. More than 50% voted to divest from Israel. Israeli, you know, companies and stuff. So that's my expectation is if not next year, probably. Layla. Samana. جربي جربي حفظي Can you speak up? I can, yeah, I can speak up. So I was if I might have to mash out and listen. I'm going to listen to the laptop. I'm going to listen to the laptop. I suggest that you make it brief. Anybody, I can say a few comments, but if anyone has questions, I can answer that way. We want to listen from you, Mrs. Layla. Yeah, they want. Uh, okay, go on. Layla, go on. Where's the mic? They want to hear from you, Layla. Go on. Yeah, maybe. A little bit. Yes. Yeah, of course, yeah, they did. <laughs> easy to write, obviously, for many reasons, emotionally and otherwise, uh, which brings up the point or the question, why, why this book? And we were asking ourselves that, and we have our publisher to thank for pushing us forward because we kept saying, you know, well, what's the point? There's probably other books, you know, what's different about this? What's necessary about this? And um, what we like to see that first of all, it was very important for us, um, for the, the authors, the fact that, that we are both from Gaza, um, Palestinians, native Palestinians from Gaza, and uh, to uh, 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 the narrators of our own struggle, and this is something that I often uh, advocate for, is to own our voices and narrate our own stories and our own struggle. And it doesn't have to be something very dramatic. 
if we scream what's happening loud enough, or if the story is harrowing enough, there's enough deaths or enough blood or enough ugliness, that makes a good story. And not that, the, not that this is a fictional story, obviously. But my point being, it's often the most routine and ordinary and quiet of moments as Palestinians uh, that, for me, are the most interesting and, and uh, reflective of our struggle for the outside world. That is, in my experience, what I found that those unfamiliar with the Palestinian struggle can relate to the most. That's, for me, I found that to be the most effective way to convey our story and our struggle is by highlighting these very vital, ordinary moments that we struggle with on a daily basis. The undercurrent of our life and struggle, in other words, be it waiting for a border to open or a permit to be issued or our continuous daily struggles with electricity or, or factional infighting or whatever the case may be. Um, and so I just mentioned that because that was one of the primary uh, motivating factors behind Rifat and I being the, you know, the joint uh, editors for this excellent volume. Um, we also wanted to make sure to include uh, as many Palestinian voices as possible. Uh, of course, from Gaza, but beyond that, Palestinians living abroad, very importantly, Palestinians living in the West Bank and, and in the rest of Palestine, uh, historic Jalil or Al-Utsuyani, we wanted to show that, look, every time something happens to Gaza, when Gaza is, is assaulted and attacked, and, and it's not just us that it's affected. And to remind people that Gaza is, is part and parcel, an inseparable part of the rest of Palestine, including those Palestinians, of course, in the, in the diaspora. So we try to include as many of their voices as possible, as many of the native Palestinian voices in Gaza as possible. But we also tried to organize it in a fashion that was kind of was comprehensive of, of many facets that we found uh, were unique to this particular assault on Gaza. Not, not in a good way, obviously, but, but in the sense of how did people respond. We, had, you know, we wanted, first of all, to give the context. So we give the context. This did not happen latest assault on Gaza in a vacuum. And it was important for us to lay that groundwork for people who are reading about this for the first time to understand, look, this is what preceded this assault. That it had nothing to do with rockets and tunnels and so on, but why? What was really, and then giving that historical context, of course, of the past 60 plus years, but then also the more, more recent historical context of the, since the, the Oslo Accord, the continuous closure of Gaza. And then beyond that, the fact that closing off Gaza was a very deliberate plan ever since the 90s, but then particularly since the disengagement. It had nothing to do, per se, with Hamas's election. It just got you know, stronger after that. Uh, and then going on after giving that context to being able to say, and this was the impact, the, uh, the human toll and impact of the assault. And then this was, in the end, of course, we conclude with and on, this is a continuous, ongoing uh, struggle. It has not ended with the end of the assault. This was very important to be able to speak about the ongoing effects of the blockade and the struggles, especially of the youth. And then throughout the talk, we, you know, we highlight different voices and how they responded, be, be it uh, in the standard analytical sense or in the creative fashion. So we, we include the chapter that we like, what we call the pen, the keyboard, and the F-16, creative resistance visual age. We had an abundance of really moving poetry uh, that was sent to us that we chose from uh, that was published about this as well as as many of you know uh, digital and, and graphic art uh, photographs and so forth. Uh, we include uh, Twitter timelines as well from many people. So we really wanted to you know first of all to show that, that I, mean, I think more most importantly that Palestinians will not be silenced as as um, this seems to be the ultimate objective, is to dehumanize and silence the Palestinian narrative. And we wanted to show that it's more alive than ever, though it may not be uh, clear or visible to those who are watching the mainstream media abroad. So, so in a nutshell, that's, that's a little bit about the book, and I'm, I'm happy to entertain, uh, answer some questions, and, and even read a, a paragraph from the introduction. If, uh, but let me just stop and see if everyone is still with me while I'm talking to myself. Hello. Thank you, Leila.
can hear you very well uh, now, by the way, so you don't have to shout. Oh, well, <laughs> it's, I can't help it. It's, uh, you know, that's the way it is. Yeah. Right okay, question is to Leila, Adan, also Gaza mom and Gaza kitchen. There must be questions for Leila. I'm going to ask a question. Will she hear me? Yeah. I, I can read a paragraph. We have a question here. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. Assalamu alaikum. Let me say uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, can you hear me clearly, please? Yes. Uh, Laila, I'm sending on behalf of myself and on behalf of the attendees here in Gaza, we are sending you our best regards. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful work. Actually, um, my question is a little bit personal. Please pardon me. Uh, and please be honest. Uh, how was the experience working with Mr. Rifat? Was it boring? Be, be honest, please. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you very much. My whole life is... Uh, my personal life is off on it, so it's okay. Uh, no, it was really... Uh, we first met in Malaysia last year, and uh, that's when we had our first meeting. And I was actually very happy to be able to work with another Palestinian, specifically from Gaza, because uh, it's very rare to find someone that is, you know, very well versed, also uh, articulate, well versed in English, enthusiastic about such projects. Uh, so it was nice to have, also, you know, to represent as one woman, one man. But Alhamdulillah, it was a very good experience. He was frustrating at times, I will admit. He was not, you know, and he's very. Uh, you know, uh, unnervingly calm, so that probably works in our benefit as a team because I'm uh, a bit of a spastic and stress case. So he was always calm and always late to the phone conversations and to Skype and, uh, you know, but I don't blame him. I know that he's in a tough situation and, you know, all that radio. So Alhamdulillah, it was very good. Nice. And you guys are very lucky to have him there still. Ah, I don't want to be able to leave, but uh, I'm sure I was saying his family and his students are very lucky to have him here. Come here, please. Yeah. Uh, you have to go there? Okay. 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 Uh, hi, uh, I'm Gabel Haddad, and I would like to congratulate you upon this achievement. You might know my name because like, you were my mentor for We Are Not Numbers. Okay, uh, uh, from Gaz, like, I want to ask you as a writer, because you wrote uh, Gaza Mom, Mom, and from its title, it indicates that it's something way different from Unsilenced Gaza. What kind of challenges uh, do you find like in writing such book? And the sec my second question is, uh, like in, re in these recent uh, years, we found out uh, several books written in English targeted for the Western and for the Europeans. So don't you think now, now it's time for, for writing in Arabic for the people who do not understand Arabic? Because if we want only to write in order to tell the people, the Westerns, that hey, we have people here, they have history, they have lives, they have like lives like other people out, outside the world. Like we need also to target the, the Palestinians themselves, to tell them that we were people here and like we struggle uh, in order to pave your life. Thank you so much. Uh. Hello to you, and of course I remember you. I thought that you went out on the program with Lisa. <laughs> no, li no, Lisa. Lisa. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, excellent question. You're, you're right. I started out actually, first of all, writing hard news, and then I switched, and it was a, it was a, a long struggle to get used to writing uh, from a more personal perspective and oh, finding my voice for a very long time and accepting my voice. I know that sounds strange, but it takes a while for one to accept and, you know, be proud and not ashamed of one's own voice as a legitimate voice. And that's why I always emphasize to Palestinians the importance of finding and owning your voice and not being afraid of that voice. 
And uh, so in that sense, yes, this book was very really different. Um, and I always, though, still, for me, it is still very important to infuse what I'm writing um, with my own, you know, uh, uh, sort of personalize it with my own perspective. Um, otherwise, I find it becomes very dry. It's real. Uh, and then you're, you're absolutely right. I think there's three different audiences that we're speaking about when you're writing. Um, I think it's you know very important to address Western audiences, especially for those of us Palestinians who live in the West or have lived in the West and are well versed in the language of the West. Uh, because if you ever have a chance to come here, you'll, you'll understand how little exposure they have uh, to basically any global news, not just even about Palestine. Uh, and generally, their the ideas tend to be very, um, very ignorant in terms of their understanding, not only of the Palestinian struggle, but of, for example, Islam in general, and so on. So it's really a burden upon us who live here to be able to, uh, you know, explain and write and speak and address these issues as much as we can. On the other hand, you're, I absolutely agree. Those who are able and who have the, uh, you know, the gift of writing, especially in Arabic, which is completely different. I think we must absolutely it is the time to be able to uh, address and write in Arabic. Of course, it's going to be of a different nature. The types of things we're writing is different and might address different different maladies, if you will, that our own society struggles with. Be it, you know, accepting uh, or understanding the. Uh, sort of this mentality of the colonized and the occupied, I think there needs to be a lot, a lot written about that, and how we have become, you know, almost we become, uh, accept this condition in a way, learn, uh, learn helplessness, as they call it, that there's nothing we can do about our situation, that we deserve what's happening to us. We hear this a lot. Um, you know, just generally, a lot of the maladies that we uh, um, are suffering from that, uh, that I feel we need to start addressing, and by all means, those who are able, uh, and especially those who live there, especially the young people, need to kind of take the reins of the leadership in this sense by writing, and write as much as they can, wherever they can, addressing our own society. So I agree, and I will leave that task to you, Amanda. <laughs> More questions, maybe? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Le uh, Ms. Leila, okay, I would like to ask uh, if you are in the United States now, so what's the impact of this book on the people there? Did you face uh, some people who are impressed with this or uh, some side with the Brazilian people who suffer from a lot of things during the war and in the last year? Yeah, well, we still have not had a chance to properly, uh, you know, publicize produced the book because it literally just came out, you know, a few weeks ago. I had one major event, and of course, Nifa also has not been able to come and attend, which is a pity. Uh, but uh, I, we had one major event at a cafe in Washington, D.C. that was very well attended. It was, the room was packed, and, you know, Max Blumenthal was there, and many others. Um, Iman Muhammad was there as well. And so that was really great. People were very enthusiastic. I think it's really important. People really want to be able to, you know, read about what happened in a very, I think, sophisticated, concise, accurate way. Something they can also give to other people who might have questions about. Um, so, so it was very well received. You know, now I don't know. It hasn't really made it into the mainstream. And as you know, it's, America is a very big place, so I can't really tell you about. Um, any kind of negative or adverse reactions you might have had, though I'm sure they exist. What's the story behind the cover page? I'm looking for Mrs. Sears. She wants to say something. What message do you want to convey by choosing this You can answer for me or Laila? For both of you, you can answer this question. Laila, do you want to talk about the uh, cover page? page for Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, I didn't hear the question. Um, so basically, the cover, many of you might be familiar with uh, uh, this picture, and it's the girl's name, she was nine years old at the time, Dalia Khalifa, and it was taken by Muhammad uh, Asad, uh, and he actually won uh, a very prestigious award for this photograph, 
which was called in Arabic and in English it was called Unbreakable. Uh, and we, we went through a lot of different options for the cover and, you know, our publisher chose some kind of uh, artwork and whatever. But I, in the end, first of all, it was what we chose this because we really wanted something uh, photographed by a Palestinian uh, to highlight their work. Uh, and also it really was very reflective of the, type, the, the book's title, The Gaza and Silence, uh, and, and as well as the name of the book. So that's, uh, I think the girl was Shijaiya and uh, you know, her home was destroyed and she, she's okay now I believe, but she obviously was very traumatized and suffered as many, many others did as well. In my opinion, uh, this picture has, has become an icon. Palestine, very iconic, like a very old picture of the kid crying or the old man carrying Jerusalem on his shoulders. Uh, this is the Mona Lisa of Palestine. Uh, the picture itself speaks volumes. Uh, the girl is like you can see her face, really almost, you know, disfigured in, in a horrible way because of an Israeli uh, shell. Uh, but she's not defeated. You can see that in her uh, in her eyes. There's a smile there. She can't be on silence. She's speaking volumes in the way she looks at us all. Maybe blaming us. Maybe uh, provoking us to act, to take action, to to change. I think this is very important. But maybe in a way or another, this is the most important thing about the book. Uh, Leila, do you, wa you want to read something? Maybe uh, we can take a minute there and then uh, finish. Yeah, I was going to, well, I was going to read a paragraph, yeah, from the introduction. Um, there's also a great poem, but... Uh, uh, read, read the paragraph. Okay, yeah, yeah, I like the paragraph. Okay, so this is just a paragraph. Okay, yeah, go on. Just one minute. هو حور السؤال يعني <تصفيق> لانه ام اشرف من دار العفيفه Western media, Gaza had it coming, and by some perverse and morally vacuous logic, its residents were to blame for their own suffering. How do we make sense of all of this? Why would Israel see fit to pound Gaza over and over again? And more to the point, how can they get away with it? How can we truly understand the situation in Gaza as a means to understanding the situation in Palestine more broadly? How can we understand a place that is encircled from every angle? continuously and systematically assailed to rally voters, or to teach a lesson, or in another obscene Israeli expression, to mow the lawn, to trim those unruly, defiant hedges. Whenever Gaza is hit, it is thrust anew into the media limelight, and its residents are recast into the double roles of both victim and villain. Gaza, we fear, has been reduced to an allegory, an abstraction, we are inundated with figures and numbers attempting to depict for us what life is like in this tiniest of places. But how can words convey 
that which numbers and images and characters and online posts cannot, no matter how valiantly. How do you provide an accurate, a humanistic, a real narration of the Palestinian story that is Gaza? In Gaza Unsilenced, we attempt to do just this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are welcome. It's my honor. Thank you. Thank you, Rufa. Thank you, Leila. Thank you all for attending today's book discussion. I'm looking forward uh, to meeting you in the future. We have uh, an amazing library. Uh, do you write in English? So you can check uh, books. We've got 43 titles a couple of days ago uh, that no one in Gaza has been. Wow. Thank you to you all. Thank you.